Okay, this month we're going to take a look at adding a REST API with Pistache. And it's kind of a joke, a snarky name, right? Because, you know, it's Pistache.io, right? Pistache.io. So, um, we are going to expose a REST API to do create, read, update, delete around our little comic book database, the same use case we looked at last month when we did a REST API with RESTbed. Uh, and I took a little bit of time to um, factor out the create, read, update, delete business logic from the networking stuff. So when we are looking at the pistache code, we're just going to be looking at the networking portion and you won't be distracted by uh, anything that's like manipulating our little fake database. It's really just a vector of structs, but that's what we're going to look at. Okay, so we don't need this PowerPoint anymore. So here's um, Pistache's homepage. Let me make this a little bigger. Just yeah. There we go. Um, and this is a C++ 17 API, so that's a restriction that might lock you out. A lot of people are still uh, required to, you know, support C++ 11, maybe 14. I think, um, I think at this point that the biggest lump is on C++ 14. And um, if you think of it, if you think of 14 as kind of like a bug fix to 11, you know, that kind of makes sense that people are, you know, majority of code bases have migrated onto 14 at this point. Um, I did not experiment with uh, C++ 14 level compile flags to see what it exactly it is that they're using from 17 that's required. I just built my little code in CMake. I set the uh, standard language property to 17. We'll see that in a little bit. And uh, what's interesting about this API is that it's asynchronous. So we talked about this a little bit in uh, when we were talking about the previous two frameworks that we've looked at, Wangle and RESTbed, that because of the latencies with network I.O., you really want to use some kind of asynchronous framework and uh, schedule your work to happen when, when the, the data arrives or when the data is done being sent or things like that. Um, they have an implementation of a promise. Uh, a promise hasn't yet been standardized. And what I'm noticing is that each of these little frameworks all have their own idea of a promise and implement a promise, you know, possibly with slightly different semantics or definitely with different class names and syntax. So if you also have your own promise type in your own application because you've got asynchronous code going on in your own application and you've organized the asynchronous execution through a promise class of your own design then you know there could be a little bit of an impedance mismatch in trying to you know bridge the gap between your own promises and the promises that are coming from pistache um, it kind of feels like we really need as a community to get a standard library promise going. Um, the standard library does have the future, std future, which is kind of like a promise. It, it's got some similarities, but it's not quite a promise. Um, in particular, daisy chaining std futures, you know, to say like, well, first I need to do this asynchronous operation, and then when the result comes back, I need to invoke another asynchronous operation. And then when that result comes back, I need to do a maybe farm out five parallel asynchronous operations. And I need to wait for all of those asynchronous operations to complete before I go on and do another step. Or maybe I need to send out five asynchronous operations in parallel. And I, it, it doesn't matter which one comes back first, but I need to wait until one of them comes back first and then cancel the other four. It, so on. The, these kinds of... Uh, structures as you start doing more and more asynchronous code this is the kind of organization you need for your control flow 
Um, and it, it's kind of looking like we really sh are going to be hurting if every single framework and library is creating their own promise type and we have to juggle all these different promise types and possibly the application zone implementation of a promise so it feels like a generic promise type that um, interacts well with stood future would be a good addition to the standard library but we're not there yet I think that's going to take some time using all these different frameworks and libraries that have asynchronous operations going on I know um, the networking technical specification that is working its way into the standard also has asynchronous operations but if I I haven't looked into that in detail but if I recall correctly it does not have an implementation of a, of a promise concept inside there now the networking TS is already huge enough I don't think I think they're like trying to get things off their plate rather than add things onto their plate um, another aspect of this API is that um, in contrast to restbed when we looked at say meme types and header name value pairs in restbed they were just naked strings and in pistache they've built uh, strong types around all the HTTP headers that are defined in the standard and they built strong types around all of the meme uh, infrastructure so if you're familiar with meme types they have a main a so-called major type and a minor type so for instance application slash JSON the major type is application and the minor type is JSON and there's also uh, ways you can extend that with a plus syntax in the string and so they've modeled those meme types and HTTP header values, uh, header. So a header value is, a, is a, you know, it's a name and a value. So the name of the header and the value of the header. They've put strong types around all of those, which is nice because it means you catch mistakes at compile time. So instead of like, deploying all the way to a customer and then find out you spelled the name of a header wrong and that's why it's not integrating into their external system correctly because when you're building a rest API what you're trying to do is expose you know your business logic your application what have you to automated services that exist outside of your control right though that's the whole point is allowing your logic to be integrated into other systems and to do that you need to make sure that all the headers are used correctly and all the meme types are specified correctly and so on um, they mention in here also you see this down here this they have a rest description DSL to easily define your API's DSL's domain specific language and while it's true that it does have that feature it's not documented and you have to rely on the source code and you know it you can kind of figure out what needs to happen but because it's not documented and the source code is not annotated with even docsgen comments so you're kind of left to in a, in a certain sense reverse engineering the implementation to figure out how it exactly works um, so in my example here I did not use their DSL they, they have an example we'll look at that uh, just to give you an idea what the flavor of it was and, and for my simple example uh, it wasn't particularly burdensome not to use that DSL I just used their basic functionality so um, as I was drilling through it I also noticed that they had some support for this thing called swagger which you might um, it's it's apparently now called open API formerly called swagger this is a way that you can programmatically document the API endpoints of your REST service so that um, with a little bit of JavaScript glue you can get a, an interactive uh, front end to your REST API so people can experiment with your REST API manually just by poking at it in the browser without using any kind of external tool. I'll be using this little guy, um, the same tool that we used last time. 
when we did a rest bed example and I've just updated um, all my little canned recipes here to use port 8000 we'll see why I had to do that in a bit but um, this is what I'll be using to test my rest API it's this is a Chrome add-on that you can get from the Chrome web store it's free there's a commercial version but I haven't found any limits on this one for for my simple experiments um, but it's nice to know that you can glue pistache into this if you choose there they, they do it in their example of where they're showing how to use their DSL um, but again not really documented so um, kind of hard to use out of the box without reverse engineering the implementation so if we look at their documentation what do they have well um, so they have a page talking about asynchronous HTTP programming and how it results in their or how it manifests itself in their API and this is an example here uh, let's make this a little bigger that any time you are writing results um, you get back a future uh, sorry you get back a promise and uh, with the promise then it, it represents a placeholder for a value that you will get in this case the, the value is the number of bytes that are actually written to the response and you can say um, on the promise you can chain up what's supposed to happen next so in this case they're invoking a, a, a lambda that receives the number of bytes that were written on the response and uh, this part here in the curly braces of the lambda is what gets invoked in the normal case and then the second argument is to say what's supposed to happen if an error occurs and in this case they're using a built-in error handler from pistache that basically says don't throw an exception if an error occurs just kind of swallow the error and let it uh, disappear um, or did I get that wrong they gotta ignore exception so they're saying async no accept is a special callback that will call standard terminate if the promise failed okay so this is if if you get an error it basically calls terminate it's kind of the equivalent of if you had said this code was no accept and then somebody threw an exception in there the standard says if codes marked no accept and an exception is thrown then std terminate is called um, but you can ignore the exception you can throw which is the equivalent of uh, checking that the promise contained an error and not the value that you expected in the success case and then manually invoking a throw um, you have to uh, be careful with promises because promises will be daisy chained so y if you've got five promises in a row and the first one errors you don't want to uh, have a throw an exception thrown into the other promise handlers you want the error handling to be uh, daisy chained and, and work out such that at the point where the promise was created when you try to get the value instead of getting the value it throws instead it, th this is very similar to what uh, stood future does it either records an exception or it records the value when you ask it for the value if an exception was thrown from the asynchronous operation it was captured into the future and when you ask the future for its value it then throws the exception because that's what was captured not the actual value uh, and here they're showing an example of how you can daisy chain these callbacks onto a promise so the, again this is saying we're gonna do something that returns a promise and when that value materializes from the asynchronous uh, invocation we'll do this step and then after that step completes we're going to do this step and you know they've got a uh, an error handler in here explicitly instead of one of their canned error handlers okay so that's their philosophy on asynchronous programming everything's done with promises uh, here headers is in the in the context of 
the name value pairs in an HTTP request or response. There's referred the the whole collection of name value pairs is called the header of a of a message. See, the message is either a request or a response. There's a header in both, and there's a body in both. And here they're saying um, that what they've done is used strong types to identify all of the predefined headers in the HTTP standard and if you want to fetch a particular if you want to fetch the value of a particular header you can do it with a strongly typed interface and you may need to define your own custom headers the HTTP standard specifies a number of standard headers but there's also the ability to include your own arbitrary headers into the request and the response so here they're just showing you how you would make your own strongly typed class to represent your own custom header and this little name macro glues in the string that represents the name of the header that will be placed or the name yeah, the name the name of the header field that would be placed into the request or response header. And you have to um, provide a way to parse or a way to write those header values to and from the request or the response. Uh, and here they're just showing you an example of how to do that with their own protocol version. Um, Now, we're going to be using uh, doing a REST API, so there's going to be uh, HTTP requests flying back and forth. And their basic idea of how to handle that is to write uh, an HTTP handler. And the handler receives a request by const reference, and it receives a response writer by value. Now, um, this means that the request is immutable and all the code that you write that indicates how the server is responding to the request goes into the res into the response um, they um, have a bunch of convenience methods on this response writer that allow you to put in the typical kinds of values that you want to put in there so every HTTP request results in a response that the first thing is a status code that is this code argument and here they're showing you how you can put a std string in there and you can say what the media type of the body is so for instance in our little experiment we'll be sending back JSON so we'll be specifying a meme type that's application JSON. <clears throat> uh, they have an overload that you know you can put in fixed character strings, so you don't have to create a std string if you're just sending back a string literal. Uh, if you're sending, um, if you're streaming, uh, so if you've read the HTTP specification, you know that down inside there there's a thing called chunked encoding, where you may you know have a request that comes in and you're going to send back a huge file. In response to or a huge stream of data could be doesn't have to be from a file but a huge stream of data and you don't know how much data you're going to send up front so you can't say how big the response is you're going to tell HTTP I'm going to keep sending you chunks until I'm done so they have a mechanism for doing that um, chunked encoding you get a, a stream from the response and then every time you use the stream insertion operator it results in sending a chunk and uh, when you're done you can send the end s into the stream and that will indicate that the stream is finished um, you can also flush any stream buffers if you need to um, and they have this warning here that um, once you start a stream that the headers on the response become immutable so you should put any headers in there that you need first before you start doing the chunked encoding on the stream and that's because if you look at the HTTP protocol the all the headers are transmitted first 
and then the body is transmitted and when it's a chunked transfer encoding the body is represented as a series of chunks well by the time we get down to putting the chunks in on the response the header has already been written out so it, it's too late to make any changes to the header at that point um, and they also have a a convenience for just you know sending files at, you know on the response um, they also have a means for controlling timeout on requests so if your business logic for instance is going out on your own internal network to access some other access some other kind of server to get the answer that needs to go back into the response that means your internal server could go down and you might want to impose a timeout mechanism to say you know if I haven't responded in a certain amount of time then we just need to abort the whole request so um, here's an example of them doing that here they're saying they, you know they set the timeout for 500 milliseconds it can be an arbitrary duration uh, and then when the timeout occurs they're just gonna send a, a no content request or sorry on the request they're gonna send Actually, I think this is backwards. This should be writer.send, not request.send. Uh, on the response, they're going to write a you know HTTP code of no content. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they have this little DSL for describing your REST API, but they don't have any documentation on that yet. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to do is to figure out how to map the URLs in the request to callback code in your application. So right, this is how you wire together the resources that are represented by a REST API, map them to some kind of business logic in your application. So they have um, a router. This is what we're going to be using instead of that little DSL language that isn't documented yet. We're going to be using the their router here and basically they have a method for each of the HTTP verbs and you specify uh, a string to identify the route either a static route or a dynamic route where the dynamic route includes parameters and um, it looks very much like this in our example code so you which we're going to look at in a second. So here they're saying if it's a get request on this URL, then bind it to this member function on the user's API, which presumably this code snippet is on the user's API class, and that's why they're supplying the this pointer. So they're binding a member function to a member or to an instance of user's API. In this case, it's in the user's API class, so it's the this pointer. And then the callbacks are invoked with a const reference to the request, and you get a response writer, and the response writer is what you use to scribble out your answer. So let's take a look, let's refresh ourselves with the routes that we want so in this is the code we looked at last month where we're looking at using rest bed but you can see I've got a this is a comic book database so I am specifying that slash comic slash some number sequence is with a get HTTP get verb is what we use to uh, read a comic out of the database read a record out so that's the read operation when we post to that same URL with a delete that uh, the, with the HTTP delete verb that's a delete operation and with the put verb it'll be an update and then without the ID we can either put or post to create a new record in our little database now uh, another limitation of pistache that isn't obvious at first is that this is Linux only so in addition to being C++ 17 it is Linux only and it is available through VC package 
as well as the normal Linux like you know apt-get on Ubuntu and so on so what I had to do since my environment here is Windows that I'm operating on I ran WSL I tried to get so I had an old WSL that was the Ubuntu 1604 and Pistache wanted a newer CMake that wasn't available under 1604 so I had to I tried updating <laughs> I tried updating the Ubuntu inside WSL but that didn't work so I had to uninstall WSL and and then install the new one from the Windows store and that got me Ubuntu 2004 which got me a newer supported CMake that let me get a pistache in here so um, what I did is uh, I didn't need to do this because I was using VC package to get pistache but I had git cloned it here just so I could um, it's always handy to be able to have a copy of the source code to reference and not just libraries um, And I have my little comics database. So inside here, this is my little toy example. We'll look at the code in a second. And what I did that's a little different from last month is I separated out the application code from the networking code. So the comicsdb.h this contains all my oops this contains all my business logic so I have a way to load my database from somewhere and return it back I have uh, my read operation my delete update and create those are my business logic operations operating on my database and as I mentioned my database is just a vector of structs so the business logic is all pretty simple and as someone mentioned in the YouTube comments for last month's video, I wasn't properly uh, doing a lock around the read operation. I am now. Let's move this up a little bit higher. Uh, I am doing a lock for the read operation. And the reason that I, that needs to be done is uh, I am accessing the vector by ID here. So if somebody was trying to delete the ID that I was trying to read then I would get you know invalid data here because they would have deleted the entry while I was trying to read it so uh, everything should be now properly uh, locked because this again this is code this is all going to be invoked asynchronously on a thread pool so we need to make sure that our application data structures that we're accessing in our business logic have proper locking around them if you don't have that in other words, if your application is not yet asynchronous or thread safe, then uh, you're just going to have to you know, add an extra layer of uh, locking around that so that you can guarantee that things are going to be safe for concurrent access. So in my little comic service here, this is our pistache networking code um, I am using port 8000 by default last month I was using port 80 by default because I was running on Windows and Windows is perfectly happy with letting me write regular user code that serves up requests on port 80 but uh, Unix doesn't like that Unix protects the port numbers below 1024 and so I'm using port 8000 in this case and if we go look at their little their little getting started example here um, oh by the way at the top of this page this header file does not exist so don't write any code that includes pistache slash pistache dot h there is no pistache.h that confused me at first until I realized that this include down here was different from this one up here so just so you know when you're going to this getting started page yourself just ignore that thing at the top um, so in, in this simple example they're creating 
an HTTP handler. It implements that on request, receives a request and a response, writes the uh, results to the response. They now they call this an endpoint. The, the endpoint is basically your web server. Now, in previous libraries, when I've done REST stuff, I always thought of the endpoint not just as the host name and port, but as the host name port and URI portion. So it's a little bit different terminology than what I'm used to. I, I'm, I'm not a full-time web dev, so I don't know what which version of that is more common but just so you know that that's what they mean when they talk about an endpoint an endpoint is an IP address and a port number uh, the IP address obviously you could specify that just as a host name and it'll use DNS to look up the host name and get the IP address but really ultimately what counts is the IP address and the port number that identifies a unique service is the old school way of Unix terminology for these sorts of things. So they um, initialize that endpoint. See, even here, they it's kind of weird. They call it server, but then this is called endpoint. Anyway, they initialize uh, that server with some options, which is, in this case, it's just they're saying use a single thread. And then that has to have a handler that responds to incoming requests. And in their case, it's this simple hello handler and hello handler here you notice it doesn't care what URI so what after the host and port number portion of the URI there's the path it doesn't care what path you act what what path you ask for it's always just going to respond with status code OK which is 200 and say hello world in the body so in this case there's not any routing or any analysis of the path part of the URL to decide what to do about resources and uh, they're also not looking at the HTTP verb so it's um, it's always going to be answering hello world um, now in our code let's do it this way let's get back over here Okay, so since I had to do everything under WSL to get this to work, I don't have like my fancy IDE here. I didn't feel like you know trying to wrestle with C line. I'm just using VI, and I've got uh, a Ninja build over here. If I say Ninja, everything's built built, so there's nothing to do yet. <clears throat> okay, so we have to have a some kind of server address that we're going to answer to specify uh, you know what IP address we're going to use and port number combination we're going to have an endpoint that we've created to go with that we're going to use their router to uh, map URIs to callbacks let's make that a little wider so those lines don't wrap and I've got my comic book database that I've loaded from my business logic now if you wanted to truly separate uh, the networking part of your code from your application you know this database here would probably not be located as a member inside your networking class you would have some kind of you know service or something that let you get lets you get access to the database and perform operations on it and you'd hold some reference to that service here so that you know the networking service is collaborating with your business service but this is a simple example so it's still separated but it's just an instance of that class is just sitting in here and in our uh, in our router here so this is our this is our router and we're calling these static methods to configure the combination of HTTP verb and path portion of the URI to bind that to a callback on an instance of a class. So my service 
is going to have these member functions that do the particular operation but they're only doing the network part which you can see down here in, in get comic we'll look at that in a second so I've got the get this is the read operation I've got the delete verb that's the delete operation I've got the uh, put on a single ID that's the update operation I've got put on no ID that's create operation or you can post on no ID and that's also a create operation now since the only difference between the put and the post is the HTTP verb there's a single uh, service method that responds to both put and post for creating a new entry in the database and here you can see how I can fetch out a parameter from the request so inside my when I use the router to register this path this colon name syntax allows me to specify a parameter now unlike restbed uh, when we did restbed you could specify that the uh, the type of the pr or the the acceptable value for the parameter was specified with a regex so we could specify that the parameter had to match a string of digits they do it slightly different where you just specify which portion of the URI or the path portion of the URI refers to the parameter and then down here they have a typed getter that allows you to obtain that named parameter so we specify the name of the parameter this colon ID string here and we say we want that parameter as a stood size T it it does a parse tries to you know extract a stood size T from that text and if that was successful then we get back the ID I'm not sure if this throws an exception if the parse fails I didn't uh, test my code here to see I, I just tested happy path so I didn't test the the error handling there I don't know if this needs to be inside this try or if um, if the parse fails I, I guess it must do something like throw an exception because this just gives me back the the raw type so I bet it throws an exception if the parse fails because there's no indication of the valid type up here when we register it so it, it wouldn't be able to handle it in the router it's got to handle it here inside the, the callback so probably need to put this inside the try block to be best practice here I'm just this is my business logic right I'm just going delegating out to that function that takes the database and gets the associated record out of it for that ID and then I am again using some business logic to convert that record into a JSON string so while they have support for uh, the JSON meme type I didn't see in here any direct support for mapping my application data structures to JSON via pistache now when I fetched pistache it said it had a dependency on rapid JSON so somehow they've got rapid JSON glued in here but again we, we've we already looked at all the documentation and they didn't say anything about this so I assumed that I had to do it myself uh, especially since the send method the overload is uh, you know the second argument here is a std string and then this is their meme type and this is the response code so there's no overload of send that's gonna you know that's templated or something to take my application specific data type and then marshal that into JSON somehow so um, it's okay I had my two JSON function from last month so I didn't need to write that again I just reused that and that two JSON is using rapid JSON under the covers to take my application specific data type and return a std string uh, I might have gotten a runtime error from my read comic function which um, validates the ID that was given and if the ID is not appropriate it throws a std runtime error so when that occurs I'm going to use a not found HTTP status code 
for the body of the response, I'm going to use the message from my runtime error, and the type of that message is text plain. And then if I got some other arbitrary error, I don't know what that is. I'm going to use an internal server error HTTP response code. The body of the response will just say internal error since I don't have any additional information, and that's also text plain. If I don't specify the meme type here, then the meme type header is not included in the response, and my little REST API tester was not happy with that. If I um, try to invoke that error path and I haven't specified that the error message was text plain, then it says like, oh, I don't know how to parse the body of the response. You could always look at, it gives you a way to look at the raw value, but it didn't know what to do with it. So I was specifying that this response body was of type text plain. And my um, other methods, they're all similar. So you can see like delete, update, create, they're all very similar and in fact they were similar enough I was thinking you know really what's especially if I move this inside the try which I you know now that I think about it it probably should be inside here so we'll just, just do it now let's put that inside there put that one inside there Okay, so now all the uh, happy path stuff is inside the try catch. And so this is now like the only thing that's different between all these response methods. So I could abstract that out with a helper that took a lambda, did a try on the a try catch on the lambda. If it caught a, a runtime error, it would just report that error message and if it caught something else it would report internal error and that would el eliminate this duplication between my create read update delete methods um, for those of you who been around for my previous presentations I really dislike duplication but I, I rather than complicate things with an additional layer of lambda for the purposes of this presentation I just thought we just leave it naked like that but you can see it's it, it, it it's a bunch of duplication so if this were production code, the next thing I would do would be to squish out that duplication probably by using a lambda, a member function that took a lambda and the request and the response and did the try catch around the lambda and all the, all the error handling with the request and the response. So that's what the code looks like. If we go back over here, we can make this since I changed it. Uh, and if you're a Linux oriented developer and you haven't switched to using Ninja yet for your CMake projects, it's strong recommend. It, you can also use it on Windows now. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a nice build tool. Um, okay, so I've got that and if I run this service, let's see where is it? It's in Comics DB, Comic Service. So if I run that, I threw a little message in there just so you know it's actually started on port 8000 with 12 threads. We can go over here to our REST API tester. Let's make this a little bigger. And um, my database is pre-populated with a couple comics. So this is the title. It's issue one. The writers, Stan Lee, penciler, Jack Kirby, anchor, George Klein, letterer, Artie Simic, colorist, Stan Goldberg. And if I fetch ID 1, it's a different comic. I don't have an ID 2 in there, so this is my little error message that's coming from the what string of my std runtime error that I threw when I validated the ID and my business logic. If I want to, I can update ID 0. So this issue one here this is just you know business data this is the not the resource ID the resource ID is up here in the URI so if I update resource ID 0 I send this request I get back a body that says ID 0 was updated here's the old value for ID 0 it was fantastic Four number one if I go and fetch ID 0 now 
now it's Incredible Hulk number one and some of the credits changed as well if I so that's the update operation I can create via put method so I'm gonna create Incredible Hulk number one this got allocated to ID 2 and now when I try to fetch ID 2 so I'm fetching ID 2 here send that off now it comes back there's still no comic at ID 3 so that comes back as invalid ID but if I create with a post instead of a put I'm posting to slash comic instead of putting to slash comic this is uh, Amazing Spider-Man number one. If I send that in, it says created ID number three. And now if I go back over here to a get on ID three, it comes back with that newly created data. I can also do the delete verb on ID one. Tells me that it deleted it. If I go back and try to fetch at ID one now, it says invalid ID. So very similar to what we saw with the rest bed library. The you can see that the request and response handling is a little different. The um, in in you notice I'm not I'm also not directly manipulating any promise structures and that's because when I registered with the router I am using their helper that binds a method on a class to this signature return void take a const request reference and a response by value and it is invoking that method inside the promise type for me so I didn't have to worry about you know dealing with the promises if I I think there's a lower level router on the sorry a low level API on the router that if you need to use the promise mechanism because you need to do some fancier handling then uh, you can do that but because this is going to be invoked via a asynchronous callback I needed to make sure that my business logic was all properly secured for asynchronous operation uh, via some kind of locking or what have you yeah, we can use lock free data structures obviously it doesn't have to be a lock but a mutex was the simplest thing here and that's what we're going to do because you know this is not a talk about lock free data structures this is a talk about pistache um, I do kind of like that once I got the business logic separated out and um, now all the code that we're looking at here is just all, the only concern is networking so if I were to have some kind of plain console oriented application that was going to manipulate that comic book database there's no networking code that's getting in the way when we did it last month with um, rest bed I didn't follow that strict separation and you notice here like the the create comic call is taking this network session object and you know it's it's fetching out the request it's you know so this stuff is this is all networking junk and it's mixed together with application logic and when I was looking at redoing this example this month I, I decided I didn't like mixing these two responsibilities together so separating them out uh, I think worked out a lot cleaner the the networking code is clearly this is all networking code there's no application logic here and by having that separation of concerns between the business logic and the networking I'm now free to change the networking to be something else or be something that's not networking a simple console app or a GUI app that you know isn't network enabled it can just manipulate the underlying data structures by using the same API 
and doesn't have to worry about you know the networking getting in the way and the networking here is not um, directly coupled to whatever my database mechanism is I mean in my case it's just it's just a stood vector you know it's just you know that's my database is a vector of structs but that's completely hidden inside here so the fact that it's a vector of structs nobody else cares or even knows um, you know I'm loading from fixed data but nobody else knows that that's completely internal to this class that's doing these uh, operations from the responsibility of my application so um, that worked out nice so the main shortcomings of pistache and I really wish they'd said this right up front is that it's Linux only which is kind of disappointing because honestly we've had portable network layers for C++ that go across WinSock and BSD sockets that stuff's been been done for 20 years already so it's really just disappointing that this is Linux only um, I mean I beat it into submission using WSL but still that's disappointing um, the documentation is a little sketchy this library's been around for seven years so for them to still have the documentation in such a primitive state is also disappointing but um, for my simple use oh, ebang You know, routing up these URLs, hooking them up to callbacks, that was simple to use. That was straightforward. Uh, I do like the strong typing support for header fields and for meme types. I thought that was kind of a nice idea. They claim that they got it from a Rust library called Hyper inspired by that so they didn't imitate it but it's inspired by um, so not bad but doesn't feel quite ready for prime time use um, the in particular the lack of cross platform network support is disappointing um, and the reason for that when you drill into the source code is that they've written all the networking code themselves so they didn't layer themselves on top of another networking library like boost ASIO that's what RESTBED did, and that's why RESTBED was able to have portable cross-platform asynchronous networking. They didn't rewrite it themselves. They used Boost ASIO, and Boost ASIO has been around for, geez, 10 years at least, i got to say. So before this pistache library was started. So not bad, but could be better. Um... It is intriguing, this DSL for describing uh, your REST API. Well, let's take a look at that. I threw it up in Visual Studio. It was another thing that was interesting. Okay, they do use CMake for building their library. Uh, let's drag this over here. But they didn't include building their examples in their CMake code. It's not that it was conditionally enabled, it wasn't enabled at all. They had no build whatsoever for it, so I had to add that just to be able to uh, use my fancy IDE navigation features here to look at what their um, samples were doing. So to me that's not a good sign because it means their examples are not being continuously built every time they push a change so how do you know that you're not changing the library API in a way that breaks your example or that your example is still working uh, it's not integrated into their um, continuous integration uh, presumably if they're just using like you know it's a github repo right so presumably they're just using something like AppFair or 
um, Travis or built-in GitHub workflows for continuous integration. And if there's no, if it's not wired up through the build, how is how do they keep it working? Um, anyway, here's what their domain-specific language looks like for describing a REST API. Um, you can specify generic information about the REST API, its license, and here's a, a generic uh, response that they've you know assigned into a variable so that they can reuse that as they go through their REST API description. Um, they're specifying that the URL schemes supported for this REST API is HTTP. If we drilled into this, you can see that other some other options are HTTPS, uh, and you may not have seen WS and WSS before. That's WebSockets and Secure WebSocket uh, URL scheme. So, presumably, there's a way for using all of this through WebSockets. There's no example that I saw that was doing WebSockets. Uh, that was another area where RESTbed had support that looked, uh, and, and the, given that RESTbed's documentation was was nice and up-to-date and complete, we could rely on that. Here, they're specifying uh, a base path slash v1. So if you get into REST API design philosophy, it's recommended that you version your REST API so you basically put at the front of the URI path, you know, slash V number so that you, uh, if they specify with no version number, then they get the current, most current version of the API. But if they're um, going to be breaking changes between major versions of your REST API, you want to have clients connect themselves to a specific version so that you're not like yanking the rug out from underneath them because with these distributed systems right you're updating your web server all the time that provides the the rest api and you've got clients out there that depend on the old behavior associated with your old version so it's a good idea to have a versioned url scheme i didn't do that in my little example because we're just kind of exploring this library here uh and there you've got uh saying that they're producing and consuming application JSON as the meme type from their API. So here's a route where slash ready is bound to this callback function. And uh, if we look at that little callback, it doesn't actually do anything except write a one and a HTTP OK response code. And um, they're chaining on. It's not clear if which one gets called, right? They've bound it to a callback that does, uh, you know, send an OK. But then they've got this response on here that does HTTP OK. Again, since this isn't documented, it's not clear you know which one of these is being invoked or are they both being invoked um, they've uh, so here's one where they're binding to that they got the response in there again maybe I think some of this is for that swagger open API documentation stuff and some of it is for the actual handling of the routing. I think, I bet that's what's going on. I bet this is for the actual response to the routing, and then this stuff is metadata to help describe your API for the interactive API explorer. It's hard to know without having, you know, see there's not even any doxygen on this method, so you know, it's hard to say. It's definitely a description of the response, not the actual response. So I bet that's what this is doing, is specifying metadata associated with your uh, URIs, your, your path URLs here. Anyway, that's what their little description, REST API description domain-specific language looks like. Um, I decided not to play with that since it wasn't documented and there weren't any real, I mean, the code over here is pretty much devoid of any comments. 
there's not even like a block comment at the top that explains anything other than it just an API description reflection mechanism that is based on swagger so that's the most that it's documented so I decided to skip that for what we're doing and that's pretty much it it not bad but feels a little I mean they say it's only <coughs> they say it's only version 0.1 but it's been around for seven years. Um, let's see what pistache. Let's see what their commit history looks like. Well, you know, they merged a pull request twenty one hours ago. Could be just build noise though, and not real. Accept header no locale. This looks like a real pull request that was merged June 6th. This is real code. This is a real contribution. So, you know, it's getting developed. Um, it's probably, you know, scratch my own itch kind of development where if there's a shortcoming that they personally are feeling pain on, then they're merging feature requests to fix that pain. But, uh, since they wrote it they don't need the documentation so for them it's not a pain point it's just a burden which is you know par for the course for a lot of open source libraries so overall not bad doesn't feel quite ready for prime time uh, if I had to choose between this and rest bed I would I would pick rest bed just for completeness sake and uh, and definitely the cross-platform networking that's a big deal if you're if you're it's a big deal for me. I mean, there are people that, you know, they only have Linux server farms, so they don't care about cross-platform. But for me, I work cross-platform, so it's important to me. If there's any questions or comments, we can take that now. Use either chat or audio. I don't care. Okay, doesn't seem to be any questions, so we will wrap it up there. This presentation will be uploaded to YouTube probably later this evening. And you can always go and check out, uh, there's about two years worth of presentations on there that you can check out if you want to see older stuff. And thanks for joining.